How are you doing? Good. Right. Oh, here we go. This looks good. So, um, I'm Alex Nisbet. Um, I'm from Live Work in London. And in a change to our schedule, um, I'm going to be talking about the design and delivery of the London 2012 Spectator Experience, OK? Apologies if anybody was expecting Todd up here. He's been taken on well. We wish him all the very, very best. Um, so I was quite happy to uh, step up, step in, whatever you want to call it, um, and uh, tell you a little bit about a story that um, a thing that happened to me a couple of years ago, which was basically um, my, my, my dream project, my dream project come true, if you like. So I've worked at Live Work for the last two years. Prior to that, um, I worked for LOCOG, that's the London Organising Committee of the uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games. So they're the people that are uh, sort of chiefly responsible for organising and running the Summer Olympics. Um, I was um, the first service designer there, although to be fair, I was actually called a project manager. Um, but then by the time um, I kind of left, uh, my official job title was service designer. And I don't know if Tamsin Smith is in the audience. Tamsin, she's up there at the back there. She was my co-service designer um, uh, at the Olympics. Um, right, so um, can we actually, is there any chance we could turn the lights down just a little bit on the screen? Because this is pretty much all pictures, OK? And I really want you to be able to sort of enjoy them in sort of full Technicolor. I don't know if that's possible, anybody up there? OK. Um, already. OK, um, I have to start off with a few numbers. Uh, that's really important, just to set a bit of context uh, for the Olympics. So, uh, London is only the, um, the only city to have hosted three Summer Olympic Games. Um, there were 10,490-ish uh, Olympic athletes and 4,200 Paralympic athletes. There were 36 Olympic sports, 21 Paralympic sports. There were over 170 venues. So it's not just the sporting venues, but we're talking about transport hubs, training venues, accreditation venues. Um, over 11 million tickets sold. So that's over 11 million spectators over that sort of five or six week period. Um, at games time, there were over 270,000 staff. And that includes the 70,000 games makers or, or volunteers. Um, and the, probably for some of you, maybe the most interesting number, um, the total cost or the budget was uh, $13.54 billion. Um, but luckily, uh, clever people that we were, we came in with a surplus of $572 million. Still, it's a big expense. It's a super big expense, and it's quite a high risk kind of thing to do in a way. Uh, host Olympics. Um, there have been a few cities over the years that have kind of declined to bid for it, or maybe they bid for it and figured it wasn't such a good idea after all because they didn't want to be seen to be spending taxpayers' money. Um, I'd like to introduce you to four critically important people in LOCOG, if you like. So these are the most important people that make everything really, really happen. So the first guy who turned out to be our chief executive officer, our CEO, um, he came from a merchant bank, uh, investment bank background, so he knew how to talk to the city. He knew how to get money. He knew how to organise really big, expensive activities. The second most important person actually worked at Atlanta in 1996. I don't know if any of you uh, remember, but there was a, a terrorist incident uh, at Atlanta. And London, um, back in 2012, they were hypersensitive about anything like that happening again. So the head of Game Times operations had that, uh, that particular experience. Third most important person was our head of brand and marketing. Now, he came from um, a European uh, tra train service called Eurostar. So he was particularly good at understanding customers and brand and marketing. And fourth, and uh, not really last, that's um, our chairman, that's Seb Coe. Um, he's an Olympic athlete, so he knows what it is to work super hard to succeed. He knows how, what it means to work super hard to succeed. Now, he didn't just do that on the track, um, sort of 20 odd years ago. He also did that, shall we say, in the boardroom. So this is uh, Singapore, uh, July t 2005, so that's seven years before games time. 
Um, he's just managed to pitch rather well and win the bid, and he's receiving uh, the bid documents from Jack Rogue, who was the chair of the uh, president of the IOC at that point. Um, the reason I'm putting that up there is what he said. So he sets out the stall for uh, his vision, if you like, his experience vision, right at the very beginning. He's saying, we want to deliver a magical atmosphere, an electrifying experience for competitors and spectators. So probably the most important person who said right at the very beginning, we're going to be thinking about spectators. Now, previous to this, no other Olympic Games had explicitly thought about a spectator experience. Basically, uh, spectators were bums on seats. That was pretty much all it was. There was no kind of thought about their overall experience. Um, we, we learned an awful lot from previous games, and I think probably Sydney was the start first to certainly, uh, certainly think about uh, 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 volunteers and to start to think about what a spectator experience looked like. But it was really London that has sort of set the, uh, uh, the benchmark, uh, possibly there. So after Lord Coe um, said that uh, we were going to really focus on spectators, nothing happened for about sort of five years or so. And it was clear that spectators, like customers, like consumers, they need to be owned and loved and cared for by somebody in the organisation. Um, unfortunately, they were kind of passed a little bit from pillar to post. So initially, it was the ticketing department thought that uh, they should own the, the spectator relationship. Uh, and then um, the, the, the team that sort of does the sort of crowd management, if you like, in high vis jackets, they thought that maybe they would have the... Uh, uh, the relationship. Luckily, uh, the marketing team stepped up and thought, well, no, 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 this isn't, this isn't going to work. We need to think about the whole experience, not just when you get your ticket and not just when you're walking from venue to venue. So luckily, with a couple of years to go, uh, the, the brand and marketing took up uh, the ownership of that particular client group. One of the first things that they did, now this is just a little bit before I joined, um, one of the first things they did was to say, okay, Architects, let's come together, let's, ex let's, let's understand what we think that experience for the spectators is, go is going to look like and importantly feel like. So you can imagine that uh, thousands and thousands of drawings and plans have been created for all the new stadia uh, and all the existing uh, venues. And one of the things that uh, we learned very, very quickly was that in looking at the crowd flows and the timings and the schedules, that um, up to 40% of your day would be spent queuing, lining up. 40% of your once-in-a-lifetime experience is going to be spent in a line, in a queue. Now, clearly, that's not a particularly great experience. You might go, well, that's, that's, you know, that's life, that's what we've we just got to grin and bear it. But clearly, that wasn't really going to win uh, the Olympics' many friends. Especially, and I'm sure if you've been to London in the summer, it could either be tipping it down with rain, as we've experienced uh, here over the last few days, or it could be scorching hot. Now, uh, this was the austerity games. There was not an awful lot of money f flying around to be able to build, I don't know, sort of beautiful sort of sunshades or kind of like lots of seating areas. There wasn't, just simply wasn't the money to do that. That luckily, there was quite a lot of research, but I think as one or two of the other speakers have been explaining, a lot of that research that, 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 that the client provides is, is more quant. It's more about understanding the demographics of spectators, where they live, how much they earn, uh, what cars they drive. That's not really, really useful because we want to understand behaviours of spectators. And we realised that spectators were going to be treating it a bit like a festival or a little bit like a, a kind of some kind of a fair or, or a concert, as well as a sporting um, environment. Now, some of these things will be familiar, so we uh, uh, co-created a vision, a chance for everyone to be part of the greatest show on earth, Britain's personal best. So that's, that's what everybody's aiming for. And of course, there was a, a lot of focus on journeys before, during, and after the Games experience. There was a big focus on sporting legacy, those kind of things that hopefully you're going to start doing when you get home and carry on doing for a number of years afterwards because sporting legacy uh, is a very important part of the, of the promise and also what Lord Coe had set out. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to, be, this is what we're going to provide post-games. Now, um, just a little bit of a word about uh, the team that I was in, the team that Tamsin joined. I like to say we came late to the party and by that I mean that uh, budgets had all been signed off Plans had been locked down years previously, 
and there was actually very, very little we could do. So remember that 40% of your day in queues, you might be rained on, might be sunned on. Um, so we were clearly wanted to do something about the experience, but our hands were a little bit tied. So what did we do? So what do you do is you look for the weak spot in um, the organization. Um, by weak spot, I mean the risk of failure. So this, isn't the, not the, this is not sort of return on investment, if you, if you like. This is, not, this is certainly fear of failure. Um, and there, uh, there were a number of venues which were new venues, like the Olympic Stadium, and they'd been designed very well with experience in mind. But there were an awful lot of venues which were either old, uh, sort of creaking at the edges, or venues that we were going to use in ways that they weren't designed to be used. So if you're used to coming to a venue and there's a, a two-way system, if you like, um, but at games time we're going to operate a strict one-way system. So you come to that venue and you're immediately told you can't behave in the way that uh, uh, you're, you're used to behaving, which means that people can pitch up uh, uh, too late, um, get messed about by having to then perform in different ways and uh, um, miss, their, miss their sporting uh, activities. So what we did was we des designed a strategy that was going to support positive venue operations. So to reduce risk, we had a huge risk register. It, this wasn't a, like an opportunity map, it was kind of the opposite. It's where all the problems are going to be. Where where big problems are going to be that risk shutting venues down. But in actual fact, whether you start for an opportunity map or a risk register, you actually get to about the same place. Something that's going to address the challenge, but also something that's going to deliver a good, uh, a good experience for the, for the spectators. And kind of central to that, um, that, uh, that strategy, um, if you like, was this idea of high-performing spectators. So if we can prepare spectators to get to the right place at the right time and in the right state of mind. They're going to provide that perfect backdrop for the broadcasters and the athletes. Um, they're going to uh, know what good looks like, so understand where to applaud, if you like, if it's a game that the sport they haven't seen before. Um, but also, they're more likely to spend a little bit of money on, you know, sort of uh, McDonald's or T-shirts or that kind of thing. So there's high-performing spectators. And you know what? That works for high-performing passengers, high-performing patients, high-performing uh, customers as well, if you think about that, uh, helping your customers perform more highly. Um, there are also high-performing venues that uh, kind of figured out how they were going to uh, reconfigure, reconfigure the venue um, during quiet times between uh, games and sporting events. So this is the hockey uh, arena practicing, um, you know, erecting and then taking down inflatable pitches to give uh, young youngsters a taste of playing street hockey. Um, and we got to about a month before games time. Um, a bit of a problem with communications was an interesting one. So there's a little bit of a failure here that we uh, had to admit to. Um, we began to realize uh, that a lot of the spectators, like us consumers, are very savvy, very media savvy. And if they were getting uh, emails from LOCOG, they kind of assumed it was uh, oh, something from the shop or maybe a partner is trying to sell me insurance or something like that, when in actual fact, a lot of that information was quite critical information to prepare them uh, uh, for the games. Um, we also realized that uh, a, a sort of a, an information um, spectator guide, a little uh, A4 printed uh, leaflet, which they received in their tickets sort of six months previously, uh, well, that was really vital, but if, um, I don't know about you, but most uh, spectators would get their tickets and go, oh, brilliant, can't wait to go, and they'd put them on the, uh, you know, put them on a book bookshelf or something like that and not even have a look inside. And we found out with some research that people simply weren't, weren't aware of the kind of the fact that there was going to be airport-style security, you can't take umbrellas in, all of that kind of stuff. So we risked people turning up very, very late, and possibly we'd have to close the doors because it was going to affect the, uh, the, the venues. So what we did, uh, we sent out quite a scary SMS, basically saying, you'll receive an email today with critical information. If you don't read it, you risk missing your event. Quite a scary kind of message. <laughs> now you might say, not everybody's got a, 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 a phone. Not everybody's sort of subscribed to texts. So, if we didn't see people that sort of click through to the website, which told you what you have to do, 
we sent them a letter. So that's a printed letter in an envelope with a stamp on it. We were that concerned that people were going to do the wrong thing, shall we say, when it came to games time. Okay, so now um, a word about the staff, bless us. Um, generally speaking, the press were having a real go at us. They th the press thought, it's going to fail. It's going to be terrible. We can't host an Olympic Games. So the answer, of course, is staff morale, or staff morale is. Um, so here he is going around our office, cheering us up on a Wednesday morning in late June. Um, so the, obviously that does the trick. What doesn't necessarily do the trick is when we all have to wear the Games Maker uniform. Some people loved it, some people didn't love it. But nonetheless, funny thing it is about wearing a uniform, it makes you feel all part of something. Uh, it makes everybody feel like they're working towards the same objective. Um, I quite liked it. So let's look at some of the things we did at games time, okay? Um, divided into two, really. Brilliant basics, so they're the things that you expect to see. Usually they're things that cost quite a bit of money. They've been a long time planning, so the big signage uh, totems, if you like. I actually don't think that people really, really, really look at signage anymore. I think uh, in this situation, you just follow the crowds. That's what you do. The other thing, the, the thing that uh, actually doesn't cost a penny, um, but is high perceived value, is the magic moment. So here we've, we've got a photo opportunity where you can actually hold a genuine uh, um, uh, Olympic torch and have your pictures taken. And there were cues, there were good cues behind that. That's what people loved. That, those are the memories, if you like. Now we had high performing spectators. We mustn't forget high performing staff. So they are the geniuses, if you like, uh, of the games, the ones that actually make, really do make it all happen. Now let's look at some of the things that succeeded and failed. We thought that transport would fail. We literally thought that the, the London Metro, the Tube, would collapse. It had never been stress tested uh, to the, for the numbers of spectators and users uh, at all previously. In actual fact, we'd had high numbers of sort of maybe a month or two earlier, and the Jubilee line, which was the main line going out to the Olympic Stadium, had actually fallen over. Luckily, and here's, the, here's a top tip, um, you have your plan A, of course, but you also have a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D as well. So what that means is, in a practical term, you can um, divert uh, spectators once they're leaving the stadium. So 80,000 people all leaving the stadium uh, uh, at once. You don't want them all to go to Stratford Station because that's just going to be mayhem. So you divert them to other uh, exit routes. Um, and here's a little magic moment. This took a long time uh, in the making. So negotiating with Mayor of London and TfL to be able to put on some of the um, uh, uh, information displays. Just little updates of the, uh, uh, of the event. Maybe you've left and you're on the way home and the, uh, the uh, train driver calls out on the tannoy. You never believe it that uh, you know, Usain Bolt's won gold on the 100 meters. Uh, that kind of thing. So it's a way of kind of keeping in touch with what's going on. Something that we, we thought would actually be fine um, and not have a problem with was the security. Um, I won't go into the detail, but basically the private sector organization that was going to uh, provide the security game time messed up completely. I could have used a ruder word there, but I won't. Um, and he messed up very publicly as well uh, on BBC radio, extremely publicly, and that made us all extremely nervous. Now, of course, we put Plan B into operation. We were always going to have the military there. That was always going to happen. Uh, we merely just dialed up the military. More of them come along, came along. And the military then uh, did a lot of the security, uh, as you, you could imagine, it would be totally appropriate. And we realized they were actually better at delivering customer experience than the proper professional security people. And I'm sure with you guys over here in, in uh, the USA, we have a very warm spot uh, in our hearts uh, for the military. And that made the whole experience not just feel safer, but feel more special. Um, at games time, we did most of our work was around helping people to get to the right place at the right time. And here's a couple of uh, uh, examples of that. On the left there, we've got the world famous Royal Marine Bands. So the gates open up uh, first thing in the morning, so about 7.30. Uh, and the normal behavior is that people go into the Olympic Park and then they take their selfies. Uh, I'm here, I've arrived, that kind of thing. Uh, 
Uh, that's very dangerous when you've got sort of 30, 40,000 people doing that all simultaneously. So, like the story of the Pied Piper of Hamlin, uh, the marine band sparks up, marches off into the park, and of course people then follow them quite naturally. This is something we learned from Disney. Disney do this very instinctively. On the right there, of course, sometimes we wanted people to hold back. We want you to stay in the park, to enjoy it, to avoid that kind of big, uh, big bundle at the, the, the train station. So there's actually a small girl in that sack being wound around <laughs> uh, by that entertainer. Uh, but you've got a crowd of sort of 70 or 80 people enjoying that with her. Um, <laughs> so that's what some of my colleagues designed. <laughs> but it worked. It achieved, fun it, it achieved um, the kind of objectives of reducing kind of the risk of uh, overcrowding at pinch points but it also gave people a good experience. So that kind of the two things that we're doing there. Um, another interesting thing, so one of our partners is Coke, uh, has been for a number of years, um, and each partner had a particular role to play. We designed in a role for them, and Coke, bless them, they, um, they were our portable uh, queue line entertainers. So we could, I could call them up on the radio and say, look, I'm at uh, this, the shop down here near the, um, uh, near the Riverbank Stadium, there's a really big queue. Can you send like half a dozen of these uh, uh, very energetic uh, boys and girls to do a bit of song and dance and all that kind of stuff and entertain the queues? And the queue goes down, they go off somewhere else. So kind of tactical kind of experiences, if you like. And there are other kind of festival-y kind of concert -y kind of things that you might expect at a big outdoor uh, event. Inside some of the venues, uh, we did a lot to uh, educate people as to uh, what some of the... Oh, that's interesting. There we go. Um, we did a lot to educate spectators as to what they were going to see. Uh, the ticketing policy was basically a lottery, so you didn't, couldn't always guarantee what tickets you were going to get. So you might get something that you weren't expecting. So hence, if you go into the weightlifting, you need to have a good idea of what's going to happen. So we created uh, exhibitions, uh, just explaining uh, the rules and regulations, if you like. Uh, we put on sort of more typically British uh, kind of entertainment to keep people happy. So this is, uh, this is down at Hyde Park. Uh, and then some of the uh, sporting federations kind of chipped in uh, with some interesting um, statues, uh, if you like. You know, we were so cash-strapped that we really literally had to take anything that was, uh, th that was almost good enough. <laughs> anyway... Uh, we also help people to understand sport, as I, as I said, sort of different nuances uh, in archery and other kind of complex sports that the sport wasn't able to do itself. And we also uh, help, help you try sports as well. So yes, that five-year-old girl is about to fire an arrow. Um, and who knows, she might be archery gold medalist in the future. That's how these things kind of happen, right? It's also a lot of fun. Um, other things that we did, sort of live sites, kind of more of a festival-y kind of atmosphere, if you like, a sort of traditional kind of enjoyment, uh, uh, in town, out of town, and then our mascots there uh, that created uh, uh, carbon fibre mascots spread around uh, London in particular, a good sort of good sort of spreading the love, if you like, spreading the experience. And in the background there, which you can see, of course, the Olympic rings, um, this is so cool, so that's... Tower Bridge, not London Bridge, just in case there's anybody who's confused. And of course, the bridge raises, and before the bridge raises, the Olympic rings kind of fold back. That's just awesome. I'm sure that's on YouTube somewhere. Um, however, when it came, this is all good, but when it comes to the, the show, day one, if you like, we knew, we were prag pragmatic, realistic, uh, to that last slide in the last presentation. We knew it wouldn't be right on day one. It never is going to be. You know, the best laid plans of mice and men, it's just not going to happen. We also knew it probably wouldn't be right on day two, day three. We gave ourselves the break, if you like, the realistic break that, that we know that it's not going to be right first time. There were lots of problems around queuing. There was like, it was literally, who owns the queues? Uh, we own the catering unit. We own the stadium. Uh, what about the bit in the middle? Who owns that? Who's going to help these people that are self-queuing, self-regulating, if you like, to know how to queue. Who's going to step in and speed that queuing up? Now, of course, if you've been to uh, 
uh, any major sporting event, you know, whether it's uh, the baseball, the football, the cricket, the rugby, what have you, um, that you know that there are, there are going to be guys going around with backpacks on full of beer, little trolleys, all that kind of stuff. We didn't have that. We couldn't afford it. So, but over the next few days, those kind of things magically appeared because this was just such a bad experience. So here's my only chart uh, in this presentation. So apologies, anybody that loves charts. Um, this is what, at games time, this is what I did. Uh, continual improvement of the spectator experience. So there's, in this little box here on the right, there's a number of sources of, uh, 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 of, of uh, data, if you like. Uh, so insights from questionnaires, uh, feedback on social media, speaking to the frontline staff. All of those things, on a daily basis, created a daily report. In that report, it was full of the things that are working and not working. That went to the venues and the functional areas, the departments. It also went off to the IOC and the IPC as well. So Big Brother is watching us. Um, and all of those things were then set to improve the experience. And this happens on a daily basis. A daily basis. I think there's something we can all learn about that. But we did it on a daily basis because um, there's every chance on the last day of the games it's going to be somebody's first experience. You know, I could just have my tickets are on the last day. And if you say, well, you know, it's the last day, we won't bother kind of making those little adjustments, wrong. Every day is going to be somebody's first impression, first experience. So we ask a bunch of um, quant operational kind of questions, if you like. And we generate, uh, this is my only spreadsheet, sorry about that. Um, so these are all the venues across the top, a bunch of questions down the left-hand side, and the hotspots, if you like, what's not working. And uh, no surprise, really, uh, the value for money of food and drink was poor, universally poor. Um, I think that uh, queues, at, queues for water, availability free water, that was poor. And I think uh, uh, cleanliness of toilets. So, you know, it's all the basics. The basic things you can't get right that people complain about. What a surprise. So there's a, a, a daily report. Um, that's actually a PowerPoint slide. Uh, but it's something that uh, all of the stakeholders could, uh, uh, could digest. Bite-sized chunks, if you like. Bite-sized chunks every single day, just letting the senior stakeholders know where it's good, where's not so good, what do we need to do. Um, experiential quant as well, kind of what one word sums up your experience. And these kind of word cloud things were really, really powerful because you could take one quick look at that and overall know what the temperature of, uh, of the nation was, uh, if you like, how spectators are kind of feeling. Um, so that's, I think we're quite happy, we were quite happy about that. Obviously the words did change from day to day. Uh, I just happened to take a screenshot of the best one, of course. Um, <laughs> we monitored social media, so we didn't engage in conversations. Uh, we didn't have the manpower to do that, uh, and we thought it was probably a, a, a risky strategy. But we listened and we watched. Um, and we learned an awful lot from the service users as what, what was working and what wasn't working, what the conversations are about sporting legacy. Um, what the, what the um, here we go, the one at the top right. I didn't even have to queue for the ladies' loo at the Olympic Park on the busiest day. Now that is impressive. Also, and this kind of geek, geeked me out at the time, I'm sure it's commonplace now, but this is using uh, uh, geotagging to understand where tweets are coming from. So you don't actually need to say, I'm at the Olympic Park because we would know from your, your tweet uh, where, you, where you had tweeted. Now, obviously, that falls down if I kind of choose to tweet on my way home. I mean, on the A23 down to Brighton or something like that. But, of course, we can apply kind of time kind of... We know when you tweeted as well. Um, so, again, good and bad stuff. But we're listening. We're changing. We're improving. That's the important thing. We're trying to make things better. Um, and we do it with the help of the spectators. So things like uh, trying to put in more fresh wa uh, water stations. Uh, I think there was a, 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 an organisation in the UK that provides these kind of portable water fountains, and we used up every single one in the country. The same, uh, we, um, Panasonic was our, our, our uh, provider of flat screen TVs. We used up every single 72-inch plasma screen that they had in the country. 
Um, David Cameron, bless him, said, oh, no, you've got to, I can't afford to see um, empty seats. So we had to have a, a strategy around informing spectators as to, as to where there might be some, some, empty, some um, free seats for them to, uh, to go, go and enjoy. So we used every single one of these portable <laughs> messaging systems that were available uh, within the south of England. Um, some beautiful things that we had no control over, if you like. So again, when I'm talking about the austerity games, no budget to create kind of complex and informative um, no, um, notice boards uh, or signage in the venues. There's directional signage for sure, but sort of informational signage, no way. But uh, the information points, they get inundated with basic questions. So what do they do? They find, they steal, they buy a whiteboard, and they make their own homemade signs. That's what the teams do. They also put up daily schedules because that information isn't available. And if I'm supporting um, uh, South Korea in the fencing, I want to know where to sit and which hall to go to. OK, nearly there. Um, nearly there. Um, now, um, at the end of the Olympics, uh, there's a two-week break. And the uh, sponsor of the, of the Paralympics uh, so that Channel 4, the broadcasters, ran a really beautiful advertising campaign saying thanks for the warm-up. And that's exactly how we felt. The Olympics is like two and a half weeks. It's super intense. That's where you make all the mistakes. That's where all the, the big scrutiny is. But when it comes to the Paralympics, which takes place a couple of weeks afterwards, you've learned everything. You're now, if you, you, like, you're kind of, you can relax a little bit, and now this is the real show. And we did some fairly major things in that two-week gap between the two games. One of them, and probably the most important, was to build Mascot House. Again, we couldn't afford mascots. We had a few, but kids come along to the Paralympics with their families, and they want to see Wenlock and Mandeville. So we build Mascot House. Every, everything that you could wish to do, see, buy, touch, be photographed with around mascots. And the kids and the families love it. However, I've gone forward a bit. However, actually, at the end of the day, it's not about, uh, arguably, it's not about the spectators. It's about the sport that's taking place. That's what people are really going for. So if, even if they've had a kind of marginal experience getting there, this is only going to happen once in my lifetime, and I know that I'm going to go and see some cracking world-class sport. So this is... a. Uh, uh, Nicole Adams, so she's winning the, the first ever women's boxing gold medal. And of course, she's a Londoner. And that's the sort of thing that makes the Twitter sphere go absolutely ballistic because we won something. Uh, in the Paralympics, so there's uh, Dave Weir, he's on his way to his fourth gold medal. That's what you're there for. You're not there for the signage, you're not even there to have a photograph taken with the, uh, the torch. You're there for the athletics or the, uh, the sport. Ultimately, ultimately, this is what it's about. It's not about return on investment. It's not about return on learning. It's not about, it's not even really about how many medals we won. It's about reputation. So this is a reputation of UK, Team GB. Can we host the games? Yes, we can. Can we do it successfully? I think we did. Um, and we proved that we can do that um, to the very critical audiences out there. So that's the reason, that, that's the real reason, I believe, that we did it. Um, uh, so thank you very much indeed. <laughs>